Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about the chapman kolmogorov equations for a discrete homogeneous or stationary Markov chain. One where we have time as being independent to the process. Uh, in other words, the transition from time 1 to 2 or time 20 to 21 uh, is equivalent. So we are uh, agnostic to the time dimension essentially. So each transition probability is equivalent. That's what it means for it to be homogeneous, for it to be stationary. Um, and we have this, this Markov chain here with transition matrix P. Um, we're going to define what this Markov chain is in the context of an example, and we're going to motivate why we even want to consider the chapman kolmogorov equations to help us define an n-step transition. So consider these two coins. We have coin one that throws heads with probability 0.7, tails with probability 0.3, uh, and then for coin two, we throw heads with probability 0.6 and tails with probability 0.4. So if we have an equal chance of selecting either coin on the first day, then what is the probability that on the second day we are going to throw coin one? And we are going to assume that on the previous day, if we throw a heads, then on the next day we'll throw coin one. And on the previous day, if we throw tails, we're gonna throw coin two. So this can very easily be designed as a two state Markov chain where we have state zero as being coin one and state one as being coin two. We can draw out this diagram with two nodes. We have state zero, state one. The probability of staying in state zero is going to be the probability of throwing a heads if we're already in state zero. So if we're in state zero, that means we are using coin one and the probability of staying with coin one is going to be the probability of throwing a heads, which is gonna be 0.7. Necessarily, the probability of transitioning to the other state is going to be 0.3. Uh, and then using the same logic, we're gonna have 0.6, oops, sorry, we're gonna have 0.6 going back to state zero from state one as coin two has a 0.6 probability of throwing a heads. And then the probability of staying in state one is going to be 0.4. Okay, so essentially the probability of staying in state one is the probability of throwing a tails given that you're already in state one and the probability of a tails is going to be given by that 0.4, all right? So using this diagram, we can construct a transition matrix, right? We have our transition matrix P, which tells us how we transition from state to state. So we have state zero, state one, state zero, state one. If we go from state zero to state zero, we have 0 0.7, then 0 0.3, 0 0.6, 0 0.4, just reading off our diagram here. And we want to know what is the probability that on day two we throw coin one? So what is the probability that on day two we are in state zero? Okay, so let's go ahead and write out this probability. So what is the probability that x2 is equal to zero? Okay, well, we can use the law of total probability. So this is equivalent to the sum of i is equal to zero to infinity of the probability that x2 is equal to zero given that x1 is equal to i times the probability that x1 is equal to i. Okay, and we know that the state space is discrete, right? It's finite, so it's not just discrete rather, but it's finite. Uh, so instead of going to infinity, we're just gonna go to the max of the state space, which is one here. So we have two states, zero and one. And we know that the probability that x1 is in state zero is going to be one half. So here I'm just substituting i equals zero directly into this summation. And then we're gonna have another term for that second state. 
that is also going to be one half. This is by the law of total probability, right? These two have to sum to one, right? And where are we getting these one halves from? Well, what is the probability that on the first day we use coin one? Well, there's an equal probability, right? So if we say here, there's an equal chance of selecting either coin, we know on the first day, there's an equal probability of being in either state one or state zero. So what is this turning into? Well, the probability that we're going to flip a heads on the second day is just going to be given by a weighted average, right? Because we know the probability of staying in state zero is 0 0.7. Multiply that by one half. Then the probability of going from state one to state zero is 0 0.6 multiplied by one half, this is going to be 0.3 plus 0.35, so 0.65, okay? And this is quite intuitive because if we draw this out as a tree, we know that there is essentially going to be a 0.7 chance of going to a heads and a 0.3 chance of going to a tails under the case that we pick coin one. And then there is a 0.6 chance of going to a heads or a 0.4 chance of going to a tails if we choose coin two. And all we're doing is we are taking these probabilities and we are weighting them by the probability of selecting coin one or coin two, which is going to also just be one half and one half. That's what's going to give us this 0.65. So that's pretty intuitive. And what that does is it allows us to find the probability that on day two, we're going to be flipping coin one. So that means that the probability that X2 is going to be in state zero is equal to 65%, right? Or 0.65. Now, this is very nice. This is a very elegant solution just using the law of total probability, but you'll notice very quickly that a very difficult and insufferable problem is going to start to arise. That is, what happens if instead of a single step, we have an arbitrary number of steps? So in other words, what is the probability that x sub, let's say 27, is equal to zero, right? This is going to equal, right, by the law of total probability, the sum of i is equal to zero to infinity, but the state space is finite, so it's to one, of the probability that x sub 27 uh, is equal to zero, given x one is equal to zero times, whoops, not zero, i, times the probability x one is equal to i. But there turns, this is starting to become a little bit of an issue here, right? Because we don't know what this transition probability is from the first step to the 27th step, right? That's not given by P. That transition matrix is defined in terms of a single step. So going from one to two is the same as going from 26 to 27, but it is not the same as going from one to 27, that is a 26 step transition that is not defined by P. So what we need to do is we need to introduce a new idea of an arbitrary step transition matrix, okay? So we know that given our state space, at any point in this process, we can expect to be somewhere in the state space. So what we're gonna do is we're going to define a transition matrix for such a step. So this is a 26 step transition, but we're gonna define an arbitrary one, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a little definition here, okay? And I'm going to say P in parentheses N is going to be defined as P to the parentheses N of zero, zero, P to the parentheses N of, this is going to be zero, one, so on and so forth. And then we're just going to define that on the diagonal. Then we have P one, zero, so on and so forth, okay? P to the N. 
And what this is, is this is an N step transition matrix. Okay, N step transition matrix. <clears throat> All right. It's very important that you understand this says nothing about the probabilities that are intrinsic to this matrix. Okay. What we're simply doing is we're defining this to be the end step transition matrix. We're saying there are some probabilities that exist that we need to figure out that go into each of these different entries. And we're defining it as such. We're saying P to the parentheses N is that end step transition matrix. Okay. So it's saying after N steps, what's the probability of going from state zero to state zero given a specific Markov chain. Okay. Of course, a homogeneous Markov chain, right? This is a very important idea. All right. Once again, this is not a matrix to a power. We're not talking about matrix products. We're not talking about anything quite yet. All we're saying is that there exists some end step transition matrix out there that we're defining to be in notation like so uh, that is going to give us the probabilities that we are looking for. So in other words, if we had, let's say, P to the 26, right, we would be able to solve for this value, right, quite easily, because P to the 26 is exactly what we're looking for entry wise, right here, we need P to the 26, we need the value at I zero, and then we need to iterate through all of our states. But once again, we're just defining this as a structure. We don't know what the actual value of this transition matrix is, this end step transition matrix. So how can we go about deriving the value or the values or the entries of this end step transition matrix? We're going to use the Chapman Kolmogorov equations, the idea of conditional probability, Bayes theorem, uh, and mathematical induction to go about proving this. So we introduced this idea of an end step transition matrix. How can we formalize it? Well, if we take a look here, what we were saying is the 26 step transition matrix at the entry I zero is going to give us this corresponding probability we're looking for. So if we abstract that idea a little bit, then what we get is the probability after N steps of going from state I to state J is essentially equal to the probability of x sub n equal to j given x sub zero is equal to i. So in other words, it's the idea of going i to j after n steps. All right. And once again, this doesn't say anything at all about our actual values, the entries in this matrix. But what we're going to do is we're going to leverage the idea of the law of total probability to go ahead and rewrite this in a form that's going to allow us to prove what the values of the entries are in that end step transition matrix. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to define P to the N plus M going from state I to J. So this is all arbitrary, right? So we have an arbitrary number of steps, an arbitrary state space, I to J, whatever it is, this is going to be equal to the probability of x sub n plus m being j given x sub zero is equal to i assuming that our process starts at zero all right and this is pretty clear from what we had defined here and what we looked at in the context of our previous example um, but how is this going to help us well we know that we are going to n plus m and we're going to assume that n and m are natural numbers. Um, of course, there is a bit of an edge case here, but we're just going to ignore that edge case and we're going to proceed assuming that there is some sort of intermediate step between zero and n plus m. In other words, think of a timeline where we start at zero and we're trying to go to n plus m, but we're going to make a pit stop at m, which we know has to exist because I'm saying that n and m are natural numbers. 
Um, you can also say that they are just strictly positive integers, so plus plus. Um, however you want to define n and m, I'm simply saying that you know to get to n plus m, we can make a pit stop at m and then go to n plus m. Okay, so knowing this, by the law of total probability, we can go ahead and rewrite this conditional probability here. This is equivalent to the sum across the state space of the probability that x sub n plus m is equal to j and x sub m is equal to, let's use k, given x sub zero is equal to i. And of course, we are going to be iterating across the state space for k k is equal to zero to one. Uh, we don't actually need to write it like this, but it's going to be a bit more elegant. Well, actually I'm assuming that we're, we have an arbitrary state space, so we should be using infinity here rather without loss of generality. We can continue the proof here. Um, so forgive me, we're not using a, um, we're not using the original state space. We're using a general state space here. Okay, so we know we're going from zero to m to n plus m. All right, now there's a way to rewrite this probability, which is quite convenient. And the way to rewrite this probability is to recognize the definition of conditional probability. So if we recall, let's recall, the probability of A given B is equal to the probability of A and B divided by the probability of B, right? It's the intersection of the events, A and B, given B has already occurred. If you think about it like a Venn diagram, it makes a, a lot more sense, right? So if we take a look at a Venn diagram here, we have event A, we have event B, and this is A and B right here. And what we're saying is B has already occurred. So we wanna figure out the probability of A given that B already occurred, but we, we can't have A occur anywhere here because we know B occurred. So we're gonna be looking at the ratio of overlap to the ratio of B as an event space, okay? That is exactly what this probability is saying. Now, this is a, a good review of conditional probability, but one thing that you'll have to recall about the conditional probability is if this statement is true unconditionally, if we condition it on another variable, then it has to be true as well. So for example, if I introduce a new variable C, right? So let's say I condition this on variable C, right? Then this is going to be conditioned on variable C right here. And then this is going to be the joint condition of B and C. Okay, so this is exactly the same as what we just wrote. We're just conditioning everything on event C, all right? And that's a very important idea to remember is nothing is actually changing with this definition, but we're conditioning the entire space on C and we're allowed to do that, right? If it's true unconditionally in general, it's gonna be true if we condition everything on that event as well, okay? So what does this mean? Well, how can we use this idea in this statement. That is going to be the trick here, all right? Well, if we multiply this to the other side, right? We multiply this value to this side, then we get something that looks very similar to what we have above. So you just multiply that to the other side, right? And what do we notice here? Let me go ahead and slide this up. So recall, there we go. What do we notice? This is the same as this statement, right? So this is our A, right? This is our B, this is our C in this statement here. <coughs> so what can we do? Well, we can rewrite it as this statement equivalently, equivalently, where we know our A, B, and C. So that's exactly what I'm gonna do. 
I'm gonna say that this is equal to the summation from k equals zero to infinity of, instead we'll do the probability of a, so that's x sub n plus m equals j, right? That's our a here. Given b and c, which is x sub m equals k and x sub zero equals i, times the probability of b given c and b is x sub m equals k and then we know that x sub zero is c, x sub zero is equal to i and that will do it, okay? So we're making that substitution right here. All right, now it looks pretty fancy, but really we're just using the definition of conditional probability. And if you've never seen the definition of conditional probability conditioned on another event, it's gonna look pretty weird. Um, but hopefully the different colors here made it a little more digestible. Um, but we notice something here. Hopefully we notice something here. What do we notice here? in this particular statement. Well, we're given what? X sub M and X sub zero. But we know X is a Markov chain, right? So if we know X sub M, then X sub zero doesn't matter because why? We don't have this long-term memory structure right? We don't care about what happened at zero if we know k happened at m, right? So this, everything here, doesn't matter because we're looking at the transition from m to m plus n. It doesn't matter that i was, or zero was i because we already made it to k, all right? And that's the idea of the Markovian structure here being exploited because now we can remove the dependency on x zero. So this is equal to the sum, k equals zero to infinity of the probability of, we're gonna get rid of this guy because like I just said, the state at time zero doesn't matter because we're no, we know we're in state k at time m. So this is x sub n plus m equals j given x sub m equals k, and then this is gonna be times x sub m equals k, given x sub zero is equal to i. All right, now I don't want this to seem hand wavy at all. Uh, this is literally by the Markovian assumption that we have here. This is the Markovian structure. The Markov chain itself is saying, hey, we know what state we're in past zero. And we're going to use that to help discern the state of n plus m. We don't need state zero to discern that probability. In other words, to make this more formal, the probability of x sub n plus m is equal to j, given x sub m is equal to k, x sub zero is equal to i. This is equivalent to x sub m plus m is equal to j, given x sub m is equal to k. <clears throat> That's the idea of independence here. Okay, remember when the conditional probability adds no new information, then they're completely independent, right? So we don't care what happened to x zero if we know what happened to x m. <clears throat> okay, um, but what do we know about these two statements? Where have we seen these before? Right here. This is how we defined our n-step transition entry, right? We've seen this before. So instead of zero and n plus m, what do we have? We have zero and m and then m and n plus m. So this is going to turn into, again, by the definition of an n-step transition matrix, right? This is going to be equal to the sum from k equals zero to infinity of the transition of m to n plus m, which is just an n step transition. So it's going to be p to the n. Remember, this is not a power. This is the transition matrix, the entry that says we're going from k to j. So we're going from state k to state j 
And then we have zero to M, which is an M stamp, M step transition, right? So here we have zero to M, an M step transition. So we have P to the M, and then we're going to go from state I to state K, and that is going to be it, okay? So we can go ahead and rearrange these. These are just a, these are two scalar values, all right? And what do we notice here, right? Don't, don't lose sight of the original idea. So P to the N plus M sub I J is equal to this sum product, right? But what is this sum product? Hopefully it looks familiar. This is the definition of matrix multiplication. Okay, so what we really just showed here, okay, is the idea that, this implies, if every element in IJ is the sum product from K to the entire space, through the entire state space, um, the sum product of P to the M times P to the N, then we are literally showing that the matrix n plus m, right? So the transition, the n plus m step transition matrix is equivalent to the matrix product of the n step transition matrix and the m step transition matrix. Okay? So that's pretty handy. But again, this says nothing of the actual values of the n-step transition matrix, the m-step transition matrix. How can we use this to figure out what those values should be, okay? And if you don't have any basis in mathematical proof, then this can be quite confusing because a lot of textbooks, a lot of articles, they just kind of stop here and they're like, oh, this is the Chapman-Kolmogorov equation and it shows us the n-step transition matrix is the, the series of matrix products. It's like, well, we're, we're kind of, that's, that's hand wavy. That's a lot of hand waving. We're missing the idea of induction here. Okay, we need the idea of mathematical induction. All right, and what do I mean by induction? Well, I'm talking about the case of uh, how can we prove that the values of this in general are something uh, specific, something, some sort of, are governed by some sort of equation, okay? So we have this idea that the n plus m step transition matrix is the product of the n step plus the m step, but how can we prove in general um, that the values are something? Well, what we can do is we can use induction, okay? So I'm going to say n is equal to 1, which is equal to m. What do we notice? We notice p to the 1 plus 1 is equal to p to the 1 p to the 1, right? That is by this guy right here. <coughs> All right, that is the chapman kolmogorov equation. So what we're doing is the corollary to figure out the values of this uh, arbitrary transition matrix here, okay? So we know that the, essentially, the two-step transition matrix is given by a product of one-step transition matrices. But a one-step transition matrix is just the transition matrix. So this is actually equal to the matrix product of P and P, which is equal to P squared. Okay, this is very important. These are not equivalent by definition. This is a consequence of the chapman kolmogorov equations right here. Okay. So P parentheses squared, or sorry, P parentheses two is not equivalent uh, directly, but through this relationship that we just showed right here. Okay, so now we showed that when N is one and M is one, that we have this idea um, of it holding for, um, or this idea that the two-step transition matrix uh, is the, matrix product of the one step transition matrix with itself. So the transition matrix squared, all right? So what we wanna do is we want to show 
P to the N is equal to the transition matrix raised to the N power. Wouldn't that be nice? That would be a very easy way to compute the value for this problem right here. <clears throat> and any subsequent arbitrary transitions we're trying to do uh, given a homogeneous Markov chain. Okay, so let's assume this is how we can use adduction. So let's assume this holds for n is equal to k. Okay, so what does that mean? That means p to the k plus 1, all right, and this is the k plus 1 step transition matrix, <clears throat> is equal to what? This is going to be equal to p to the k p to the 1, which is equal to p to the k plus 1 power, all right? <clears throat> so this is essentially what we are uh, we are assuming here. Okay. So let's consider n is equal to k plus one. Okay. So the k plus one transition matrix from one is given by p to the k plus one plus one, okay? And what is this gonna be? This is equal to p to the k plus one, p to the one, right? But what is key, what is, what is uh, p to the k plus one? Well, we know by our induction hypothesis, and that's what this guy is called here. So this is the induction hypothesis we know that it is going to be the transition matrix um, p to the k times the transition matrix p to the one uh, and we know subsequently again this is by our induction hypothesis that it's equal to p to the k plus one so by direct substitution this is equal to p to the k plus one times p right, because P to the one is the same as a one step transition matrix, which is our original transition matrix. And this is going to be equal to P to the K plus one plus one. And that right there is the end of our proof. So we just proved that this relationship holds for any arbitrary, uh, any arbitrary step, essentially. Right, so this is what we proved right here. This corollary, okay? So this implies that P to the N is equal to the original transition matrix raised to the N power, so a, a, a series of N matrix products with itself, all right? Remember, this is not an element-wise operation, okay? We're not taking each element and Multiplying that element by itself, that's wrong. What we're doing is we're computing N matrix products, all right? And that's what this relationship here is really showing. All right, now it's really easy to figure out this original question, right? What was our original question? We just proved the values of the N step transition matrix, P to the N, are given by the original transition matrix raised to the N power. So let's go back to the original question, which was the 26 step transition matrix, right? For this particular game here. Okay, just paste it down here so we can finish the problem. And we know this is P to the 26 I zero. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say this is equal to, right? By the law of total probability, we need to iterate through all cases of i. We have zero and one. So we have p 26, zero, zero, <coughs> times the probability that we are throwing coin one on day one, 
which again is going to be one half because we have an equal probability of selecting either coin. So P to the 26, zero, zero times one half plus P to the 26. We can also start at coin two. So state one to state zero times one half. And what do we know about these transition matrices? Well, the 26 step transition matrix is by this corollary, the original transition matrix raised to the n power, which is 26. So this is equal to P to the 26, zero, zero, one half, plus P to the 26, one, zero to the one half, okay? And this is, I believe, approximately um, 0.6, if I recall from the simulation, um, and running the closed form solution. So this closed form solution uh, in Python, it's, it's like 0.6 repeating. <clears throat> and there you have it. That is it. The, the major thing to remember with the chapman kolmogorov equations is that we need the chapman kolmogorov equations um, and the, the corollary from the, the equations themselves to show this relationship here, okay? Because out the gate, this is not true out the gate, all right? Remember, when we have the parentheses, we're just defining that that transition matrix has to exist. All right, we're not saying anything about the values in those entries. We're simply just saying that they exist and we need to figure out what those values are. And this proof right here that we walked through shows what those values are. And that proof using induction shows the corollary that the n step transition matrix here is given by the series of n matrix products p to the n. All right, so that is going to do it for this video. I hope you enjoyed. I hope this was a. Uh, a very clear, um, a very clear introduction slash example slash proof of the Chapman Kolmogorov equations in the context of an example. Uh, I'll leave an article linked below that contains code for simulation to show the convergence of the empirical probabilities to these values. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments below. Um, other than that, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next one.